Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And this is Where Are They Now for August. Not last year August, but just August in general, going back all the way to 2018. We have five years of August to go through. This is the second time I'm doing this version of Where Are They Now. If you've been following this for a while, Where Are They Now was a series where I look back at reviews I did last year. Last month in July, for the first time, I shifted up the format for a bit. And now I'm taking a look at the last five years, every single August, picking and choosing not every single game, but rather specifically games that I think there's actually an interesting conversation to be had and one of the things I like about the way I'm doing it now is that it gives me the opportunity to kind of compare and contrast even across different months uh, you'll see what I, you'll see what I'm saying there's some interesting comparisons how I can say look look something that happened three years ago and look something that happened two years ago and let's let's talk about those aspects but either way this is meant to be a look back where I try to have a, a conversation around and I try to take a, a mix of things I'm not talking about every game I played in August of let's start with 2018 in August 2018 I picked three games to talk about Rivet Wars Eastern Front we have Hey That's My Fish and we have Dice Throne Season 1 and whenever I pick these games I'm going to be picking different uh, combinations of games some games that left some games that stayed almost always a game that captured my imagination imagination in some sense though. Rarely will I talk about a game that I played once and moved on from. You probably already knew that. Well, if you were watching back then, there was no back there were, there was no YouTube. There was no there was definitely YouTube in 2018. There was no Board Game Co YouTube in 2018. Anyways, let's go ahead. Let's start off with August 2018 now that we spent way too much time on that. August 2018, three games. River Wars Eastern Front, Hey That's My Fish and Dice Throne Season 1. River Wars Eastern Front was I don't know exactly when I first played some of these. I only started logging plays around this time frame. I don't remember exactly when. And so I started to get a lot Lot more data around here, but that means sometimes I don't know how far back I played a game. Hey, That's My Fish, for example, is a game that I don't know when I first played it, but I know that I had in my collection for years, and I loved what Hey, That My Fish did, and in fact, I believe, was it Plan B Games? I think Plan B Games recently picked up Hey, That's My Fish, and I plan on getting Plan, I plan on getting it back to, to see how it holds up, how it fares, because Hey, That's My Fish was always a great experience. It was a tactical, mean game. It was a cutthroat abstract strategy game for two players as you sought to cut people off. For me, the game that gives me that feeling right now is a game called Ragnarok from Grey Fox Games, and that's currently, I've played a few games that have that vibe, that feeling... Terra Nova would be one of them, Ragnarok is one of them, I think Battle Sheep people have said is the same vibe, but I haven't played that one, and Hey That's My Fish is a game that I think I want to get back once Plan B Games puts out their version, I think they made it a little easier to set up and deal with as you go through it, so I'm very excited to see that one out, but overall Hey That's My Fish is a game that yes, it's currently not in my collection, but I had in my collection for years and strongly appreciated the the, the two-player tactical. It's a three and four-player game too, but I don't think it shines at those player counts. I think three and four is good for a bunch of kids playing a game, and two-player abstract tactical strategy, I think, is where it shines. We have River Wars Eastern Front, a game that I enjoyed and had in my collection for years and was very excited when uh, when Steamforge Games announced that they were taking it on and putting out a bunch more content for the game, including a solo campaign, or maybe just a campaign in general, but also solo play. I don't know if exactly which details I'm remembering or not, but I do know that I'm, ex I do know that I'm excited for when the... Um, the Steamforge Games version of Rivet Wars does show up. So we'll talk about that one more because, well, in 2022, I had a chance to play Rivet Wars Eastern Front, ironically, in August. Then we had, later, we had Dice Throne Season 1. This is my first time playing Dice Throne ever. I played a, a I borrowed a copy of a friend's Dice Throne, uh, I believe, 2018, I borrowed a copy of a friend's Dice Throne. I played that with another friend, and then as a result, I remember talking with that friend saying, hey, this is currently on Kickstarter. They're currently doing Season 2 on Kickstarter, and I kind of want to back this, but would you play this with me? He's an MTG player. I'm, I was an MTG player, and it's like, you know, will this give us that two-player to head vibe it's a much lighter game than mtg but he's like yeah I'd, I'd be down for this one and i backed it and we're here with a whole lot of dice stone now it's a whole lot more dice stone than i ever planned on and that's dice stone is a lighter game i don't think it's an amazing game it's one of those games i always look at and think do i want to keep all of it i'm pointing to it up there and there's there's always going to be they just announced the teaser for more dice stone content coming soon and i'm excited but also like how many dice stone characters do i need i don't play it enough to justify getting eight more characters all the time i mean have i even played it eight times since getting marvel dice stone Probably I have, probably, but probably around that number. Probably not necessarily more than that. But either way, we'll see. So uh, Dice Stone Season 1, my first play in August 2018. A game that my opinion hasn't significantly changed. I was in, I was enraptured at first, and I think over time the enraptured went away a bit. But the good game, beautiful production has stayed. But just good, not great game. In August 2019, we're going to take a look at a few, starting off with Hoplomachus Origins. Now, notably on the table, we have Hoplomachus Remastered. I dove into Hoplomachus Tuctorum in August 2022, so we're going to come back to that again soon. But Hoplomachus Origins I played in August 2019. I don't remember a ton back then. I remember enjoying Hoplomachus. I loved Too Many Bones, and Hoplomachus to me was something I explored as part of the Chip Theory universe. And I liked Hoplomachus, but eventually it left. I don't remember exactly when, but somewhere around the, along the road, it left because, like, you know what? I'd rather play Too Many Bones 
bones every single time. We'll come back to Hopmaka shortly, when shortly means in four years from now, which will be in about 15 minutes, I guess. But either way, we'll come back to Hopmaka shortly, but I played Hopmaka's Origins for the first time in 2019, and it left my collection somewhere in the next year. I don't know exactly when. I also played Brave Rats. Brave Rats is another small little abstract, not abstract, it's a two-player card game with bluffing and trying to outthink your opponent. Beautiful game. I easily have 50-plus plays under, of, Brave, of Brave Rats under my belt, but it's a game that eventually you, I outplayed it. I think I, I think I still have a copy. I'm pretty sure my daughter still has a copy. We leave it on the shelf. She loves it. She teaches it to her friends. I've played through it. I've gone through the the various mind think and double think of playing through Brave Rats. I think it was loosely based on a game called R, if I'm not mistaken. Ultimately, you have seven cards, and the game goal is to win four rounds or four sets of cards, kind of. It's rounds, cards, whatever it is. Or alternatively, to just absolutely win by playing the Prince. Beautiful amount of mind think, double think. I, I really appreciate what the game does, but I just played it so much that eventually, eventually, I was ready to let it go. My daughter said no, thank you, and I gave it to her for her game shelf instead. Also, I played Valeria Card Kingdoms. Now, it's also worth noting that not always is this the first play. I don't remember exactly in some of these, but some of these are going to be times I played it for the first time. Others are going to be just, hey, I played that game in this month. But uh, Valeria Card Kingdoms is a great game. It's a game that I have in my collection to this day. I constantly refer to it as one of my guilty pleasure ga board games. I don't think it's an incredible experience. I think it's a good experience and a good time. Ultimately, it's Catan. All you're doing is gathering cards, rolling dice, seeing what it activates, using those to buy more things, and or defeat monsters, and or go on quests. I think the expansions add a lot of life to the game and the cooperative expansion is something I actually want to play through more. I've only played like two or three times the co op expansion and I want to dive into that more. But ultimately, Valeria Card Kingdoms is still here. It is the game that founded my love for the Valeria universe. And while I've dabbled in the Valeria universe at different points in different ways, and we'll talk about that again soon, ultimately, the one mainstay for me has been Valeria Card Kingdoms. The rest have been games that I enjoy, I dabble in, I hold on to briefly, and then I let go. I've enjoyed Margrave, I've enjoyed Shadow Kingdoms. I wasn't so much into Quests of Valeria or Cities of Valeria. Was it Cities of Valeria? No. It's Quest of Valeria and a different one that I'm not remembering. But either way, Valeria Card Kingdom still sticking around. Speaking of games that stick around, in August 2019, we also played Bunny Kingdom. Bunny Kingdom, I think this was the first time I ever played it. I could be mistaken. But August of 2019, again, this is notably right, right about now, August 2019, in another three or four, I guess another four months from August 2019 is when I start the Board Game Co. YouTube channel for the first time. As of this time, I'm just playing games just purely for the sake and the fun of the hobby. I play a lot of games, mind you, but it's purely just because I love board games. I still play board games purely because I love board games, but there is a degree of mental pressure on it as well. When I played Valeria Card Kingdoms, when I played Money Kingdom, I played them because I wanted to play them. Nowadays, when I play, let me pick a game off the shelf, when I play... I don't know. I don't know. What's a, uh, when I play Brazil over here, right? When I play Brazil, it's because I want to play it, but also because I'm trying to review it for the channel. So there is an additional layer. So back in August 2019, my uh, love for the hobby is untainted. It's as clean as can possibly be. Or, I mean, maybe not as clean as can possibly be, but close enough. Now my love is still there. Still there, but definitely mixed in with other things. But don't, don't, and also like, this is one of those moments where like someone might watch this and be like, oh yeah, Alex said on camera he doesn't like board games anymore. Not what I said. I love board games. I adore, I mean, we can't even talk about how much I like board games. We can't. But there's additional pressures on the decisions I make of pulling off the shelf and what I play. So, for example, uh, Bunny Kingdom, Valeria Card Kingdoms, these are games I wish I played more. But I, sometimes I find myself playing The Cult of the New because I always love The Cult of the New, but now there's an additional incentive in play. Anyways, Bunny Kingdom, a game I think I played for the first time in August 2019, and I still love it. I still have it around. I find very much, for a while I was on the fence as to whether I like the um, Bunny Kingdom Pie in the Sky, whatever it's called, expansion. The In the Sky expansion, I, I was unsure if that added to the experience or not. But I've actually had the chance to play Bunny Kingdom recently a few times with uh, without that expansion, which I hadn't done in a long time, and it cemented for me that I absolutely love Bunny Kingdom with the expansion expansion and like it less without the expansion. The expansion is messy and it doesn't perfectly integrate, but having tried the game without the expansion from playing with the expansion for years, I, I come to the firm conclusion that while I enjoy it both ways, I enjoy it more with the expansion. Uh, but that's Bunny Kingdom, still holding strong years later and not going anywhere anytime soon. Although I wish there was more expansion stuff. And in fact, I remember back when it first came out, there was actually the first edition had like a small board and they sold an upgrade kit for a larger board. I remember that. That was like, that was a long time ago now, a long time ago. 
In 2020, we now skip to having a YouTube channel. In fact, Lizard Wizard, the game I chose, one of the games I chose to talk about, Lizard Wizard, is one of the first previews I ever did for the channel. I say previews, but it was a review. The first reviews I ever did for the channel, but a prototype review. I think I did Northgard. Uh, I think I did that last month in July, but in August I did Lizard Wizard, and I really enjoyed it, and then I backed it, and then I got rid of it after. It's a game that I did enjoy, and I liked it, and I got it, and I still like it. I still think Lizard Wizard is fantastic, but my biggest complaint about Lizard Wizard has been that it runs a little long for the experience it gives, and there are ways to tweak that well ultimately I decided to get rid of it and I'm looking forward to instead um I'm looking forward to trying Raccoon Tycoon. I, I wonder, Lizard Wizard was meant to be a bit of a more gamified and improved version of Raccoon Tycoon, but ultimately, sometimes the simpler version can be better, and I haven't played Raccoon Tycoon yet to be able to compare and contrast. What I can say is that I like Lizard Wizard, I recommend Lizard Wizard, I think it's a great game, but I think it's a great game that runs a little long for the experience I got out of it, so the, the marketplace it gave you was a lot. The, the dungeon crawling, the push your luck, the, the set collection, a lot of things that were really well done, the spells, it's a... Even just talking about it is a good game. And it's a good game that I, I played, I backed, I got it years later, I held on to it for like, you know, six months after I got it, and then realized it wasn't getting played enough, and so it did leave. Uh, as you as you know, if you watch this channel, I am an obnoxious uh, color of games. I get games, but I call them just as ver ver voraciously, verifically, pro prolific, pro prolificarily, I'm saying all the wrong words. I call them a lot. I call games a lot. In August 2020, I also played Raja the Ganges. This is another Euro game that I don't play as much as I'd like to. In fact, it's over here. But I love Raja the Ganges. I actually got Raja the Ganges, the Dice Charmers as well, to try that at one point. But that one didn't last me, unfortunately. That one's the one that kind of felt similar to Raja the Ganges in a good way. I, I do like it. I do enjoy it. But whenever I play it, I would just... I find myself wanting to play Raja the Ganges instead, and it's not significantly longer. It's a bigger box, but not significantly longer. I kind of want an expansion for this game. And this is one of those games that kind of was around, and then I don't really see any hype or buzz around the game's existence. I think people enjoy it. I think they appreciate it. You can actually play it online. I should play it more online. It's actually on yukata.de. Uh, it's a great game. I think Raja the Ganges is, is excellent. I really enjoy the, the pathways you're laying out. I really enjoy the the um the dice rolling and the dice allocation, the dice placement you have in the game as you wander up the up the ganja. Uh, I, I think it's a great game that falls into that midway category. It feels like a nice Stefan Feld game. It's it's Marcus Braun, but like Stefan Feld, well it's Inca and Marcus Brand to be fair. Um but it's one of the things that feels like a midway Stefan Feld Euro game, which is very much my jam when I'm looking for that experience. I love a good Lacerda. I love, well, Lacerda is, I, I like a good Lacerda and I love a good Splatter. Uh, but not in any way to take away from Lacerda. I just find that my my personal brand of heavy games t tends to resonate more with Splatter than Lacerda. But I don't always have the mental mind space for those. And I find more often than not, those Feld-like games are where I go. And Feld-like games is a large category of games, from anything from Gingopolis to Twa to uh, half of Uwe Rosenberg's games, although half, the other half of Uwe Rosenberg's games are very heavy. But point is, Raja the Ganja is great. I don't play as much as I'd like to, but it is great and it's stuck around. Hadara, on the other hand, did not stick around. And I'd actually put it in a similar weight class to Raja the Ganja's. I've actually been meaning recently to play Hadara on Board Game Arena. I found Board Game Arena is a fascinating tool. Sometimes it cements for me that I don't need to own a game because I can play it on Board Game Arena. And other times it reminds me of how much I love a game, and so I get it back because I've played it on Board Game Arena. And this obviously applies to any online play. But Hadara, I found, is on Board Game Arena. I want to play it. I have not played it in a long time. But I had it for a long time. It's a it's a lightweight game that feels very reminiscent to Seven Wonders. You're basically collecting sets of cars as you try to figure out what your optimal pathway for it is. Where are you strongest? Making sure to feed your people at the same time. It's a it's a simple Civ game that I think is good, but I don't think it has the pure simplicity of a game like Seven Wonders, and it doesn't have the extra nuanced depth of a game like Raja the Ganges. So as much as I enjoyed it, Hadara ultimately left. I, I had it for years, but uh, maybe maybe two or three years, but it eventually did leave. Rubik, on the other hand, which I played in August in 2020, and I don't know, I don't know if that was the first time I played it. Rubik is relatively new. I feel Rubik just based on timing alone, because I remember getting Rurik around the same time that I got Teneris Adventures, or Arena of the Contest, I should say, which means that would place it as a game that I got back in, like, you know, I think this may have been my first play of Rurik. I really should take a little note as I go through this. And I think next month when I do this, I'll specifically tag when something is new to me or not. But I believe Rurik was new to me in August of 2020, and I love Rurik. Rurik is one of my, my favorite games of all time. If I could only keep... Well, I don't know the number of games, but if I, if, I could, if I had to reduce my collection to 50 games, Rurik would easily be there. If I had to collect, reduce my collection to 20 games, there's a decent chance Rurik would be there. Rurik is just so... It's over here. It's over here. It's such a good game. Peacekeeper Games. I think it's amazing. A Fizdan Kodansky, my favorite design from his, and he has a lot of good designs. Rurik is just delightfully tense, delightfully well done. The modules and the expansions keep it interesting, but it ultimately it's area control with a degree of kind of bidding around trying to prioritize what order your people are in so you can optimize how you 
tactically screw people over by anticipating their moves and anticipating what's important and then moving around the board in a game that has some degree of combat and killing but not actually nearly as much as you might think. I just find Rurik to be delightfully charming and a game that I wish I played more often. In August of 2021, fast forwarding a year, we're now only uh, two years behind, I played Asonia, a deck builder that I fell in love with and then fell out of love with. Uh, I don't know exactly how long that took. I think maybe seven months, eight months. Not a tremendous amount of time, but I really enjoyed Asonia. The thing I didn't enjoy about Asonia, which has been a consistent problem with me with other games in general, is once you had the expansions, you'd have to pick and choose factions to mix together. And I understand for game balance sake, sometimes you have to do things like that. But it was a charming deck builder where you laid down gems, you built your tableau, you'd, like, you'd, you'd spend gems, but you also had the ability to like permanently cast gems to kind of have a splendor like you know increase to your tableau all as you try to seek out 60 something i don't remember the name influence points whatever it was but there are ways to decrease your opponent there's ways to mix and match different things i thought i played best of two players as many of these games all want to do especially if there's any degree of take that because otherwise it just becomes a ping down the leader and i loved this one i loved it i thought it was excellent it was very some company um I can't remember the company they had a few other games but i loved this one and have nothing but good things to say about it at first the more I played it, the more it wore on me, but particularly because I wanted to mix in stuff in the expansions, but it was always hard to do so. You couldn't just bundle everything together. You had to like be like, I'm going to play with these five guilds, again, for balance sake. And I respect that, but that makes it so that I'm less likely to pull it off the shelf and table it. This is a problem that happened to me with Deus, actually. Deus is a game that recently I decided I want to get Deus back after playing it uh, recently with some friends, and then playing in a board arena after that to validate. I'm like, I want Deus back. But I never actually played Deus with the expansions because of that issue. I find myself a bit allergic to like proxying out sets of cards. It's like, allergic is the wrong term. But when I'm looking at it, I just find myself less likely to do so if it requires me to have that extra set setup stuff. So I like, um, where are we? Lost my train of thought. I like Asonia, uh, but I eventually, like, I think it lasted for me for like maybe eight months before I got rid of it. Then in August 2021, I also played Shadow Kingdoms of Valyria, a game I really thoroughly enjoyed. I'd actually previewed this maybe in 2020, meaning I'd done a bit of a semi-review of a prototype copy, but in 2021, I played Shadow Kingdoms of Valyria, and it did not last for me. It's a good game. I had it in my collection for maybe a year after I got it. I kept it around. I played it. I enjoyed it. I think Shadow Kingdoms of Valyria is likely my second favorite in the Valyria universe. Dice placement by Stan Kodansky. Uh, felt some very reminiscent to Old West and Prestiario, but obviously with the Valyria twist to it, both designed by Stan Kodansky, and I think uh, Shadow Kings of Valeria, again, is probably my second favorite in the Valeria universe. And the expansion, like, I haven't played the expansion, but I'm intrigued to, like, get it back because of the expansion, and maybe, maybe I will try it again at some point, a convention or something, I don't know. I do like Shadow Kings of Valeria, very much so, but ultimately, as while Valeria Card Kingdoms has stood, stood the test of time and has held strong for me, Shadow Kingdoms did, unfortunately, eventually leave. Nothing wrong with it, per se, it's a great game. Honestly, if I had a game like Raj of the Ganja, Shadow Kingdoms is very much in the same vein. Just for whatever reason, it was on the cusp, and it's one of those games that it's one of those games I both want to play and want to own, but have to make hard decisions around what stays in my collection because I have limited space in my well in my house. So uh, that the, that one unfortunately left. Then we have Mythic Mischief. Now over here, I actually have Mythic Mischief Volume Two, which is here. But in 2021, August 2021, I played Mythic Mischief. I think for the first time, and I love Mythic Mischief. And I have not fallen out of Mythic Mischief. I've not fallen out of love with Mythic Mischief yet. I find it is one of the best abstract games I have, rivaled only possibly by Tack. A game. Those are the two I constantly refer to. Tack is a clean abstract, and Mythic Mischief is a is a is a messy abstract in a good way. Messy in the sense that it's like more more pa player powers, uh, strongly asymmetric, a ton of things going on. But it's such a good time. The biggest downside to Mythic Mischief, frankly, is the analysis paralysis that can and will ensue as you play, as you desperately look at the board trying to find the optimal pathway towards that extra point that you can get, that extra, you know, detention against the students. You're trying to find those pathways, and there are often ways to find them. But again, that's that's a, a slight problem to the game, and it is present. The games of Mythic Mischief generally will take you 45 minutes plus for a two-player abstract, uh, unless, of course, you play the four-player blitz mode, in which case you are on a timer and you cannot cannot take your time. But I love Mythic Mischief. It's easily my favorite game from IV Games. It's easily uh, one of my favorite abstracts, if not my favorite abstract. I always go back and forth between Tack and Mythic Mischief, what I prefer, and there are things I prefer about both. And um, I don't know exactly what we're going to have from High Stakes he high, high stakes Hijinx as a new themed map, so it's more of a garden theme to it, and it adds four new factions. At least so far, I don't know what else there will be in the crowdfunding campaign. But ultimately, all I know is that I'm looking forward to more Mythic Mischief content. I don't need more Mythic Mischief content, but I... I, I, I love that game. I love that game very, very much, and that is held, held true, you know, two years later. Which brings us to August of 2022, 
one year ago. This is going to be the last year we go into. We have five years of August under our belt. In August 2022, I played Acropolis at Gen Con 2022. Uh, just coming back from Gen Con recently. And so, you know, we're, we're, we're going through that year jump, whatever. But Acropolis has held up for me. It's a game that I still play. I still play it both in person and online. It's on BGA and Mark Board Game Arena. But it's a game that continues to deliver. My personal favorite way to play it is two-player while using all the tiles because you can get insane scores. I, I think one game I got like 600 points just from blues, which if you know what's up with that, like you can get some insane scores if you're playing with all the variants and in a two-player mode using all the tiles. That's my favorite way to play. I look forward to expansions for Acropolis. The one downside is I do find it's a little repetitive, a little samey in the game. I wish it had, even, even like the way Cascadia has like different animal scoring cards, I wish there were like different ways you score things in Acropolis that slightly change the parameters of what you're going for or how you're building things out. So I do find that, you know, a year later, it is a little samey in aspects of the way the game plays, but ultimately I still love it, still enjoy it, still very much play it. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for Paleo, which I played for the first time in August of 20, um, was it the first time? Maybe not. I don't know. I played it in August 2022. I played Paleo, and that's a game that I very strongly fell in love with at first. I, love with is a strong, uh, strong thing. I probably gave a five out of five. Paleo, I gave a four to five, and I liked it a lot. I really enjoyed the stories that Paleo would tell, the emergent storytelling. I, I absolutely was charmed by Paleo and thought it was incredible. The only downside is I found that I had a few bad plays of Paleo, and something I've talked about in the past is there are so many games out there that when I have bad plays of a game, if I play a game five times and two of the plays don't work for me and three of the plays do, I find that's often enough to push me out of the experience for me to be like, you know what? I'm not going to pull you off the shelf because I can't guarantee that I'm going to have a good time when you do so. And so I'd rather play something new. I'd rather play something new or something I know that I'll have a good time. And I'm still torn in that. I was just talking to, um, Mike Kelly from One Stop Co-op Shop, and he was talking about how much he loves Paleo, how much he enjoys the system, and I was like, I do enjoy Paleo. I do. So what do you do with that? What do you do with that knowledge, with that information of knowing how much you enjoy a system, but being uncertain of how to move forward with your enjoyment because you've had inconsistently good plays? The answer, I do not know, but I know that Paleo is gone. It's not currently coming back. There's an expansion for it that mixes and matches in different ways. Uh, Paleo is a game. You should try it. You should enjoy it. I think it does phenomenal things. For me, it did phenomenal things some games, and other games fell flat, which uh, ultimately had it leaving my collection. We also have Hop Marcus Victorum, which I played at Gen Con 2022 as well. Gen Con, uh, Gen Con 2022 had two highlights for me, Acropolis and, and Hop Marcus Victorum. Acropolis has held high for me, although with the caveat and the notice that, again, I said this in my review, my biggest concern is the long-term replayability, and that has continued to be the concern. Versus Hop Marcus Victorum, the concern was never present, I just fell in love with it, but over time I started to see that there was too much grind in the experience. Hop Marcus Victorum started off as a strong 5 out of 5, and it's gone down to a 4 out of 5, which is, it, it is good, but compared to Chip 3's other games, that makes it one of my less favorite, least favorite games from them. Uh, as of right now, I have like too many bones. I mean, if, if you ignore Elder Scrolls, which I want to ignore Elder Scrolls until I play it more because I only played it during the prototype phase. But uh, for right now, for me, it's, it's, it's still too many bones at the top. Then probably Cloud Spire, but honestly, Cloud Spire and Burn Cycle are pretty close. And 20 Strong, we'll talk more about 20 Strong soon because I actually have a pre-production copy that I'll finally be able to do coverage on. So we'll talk more about that. But ultimately, I, I, I loved... I love Chip Theory Games games, but Hop Mox Victorum did fall a little bit lower for me. Now, I don't get rid of it yet. Ha, Remastered, I have not actually played yet. This is just on the table because it's easier to reach. But uh, Remastered, I still need to play. And Victorum, I'm not ready to get rid of yet because I know they have an upcoming Game Found campaign where they are adding things to the game. And some of the things are meant to address the grind, which has been a concern for players other than myself. And so we'll see what happens. I don't need to love the system. I'm fine getting rid of games. If they do something to make me love the system, fine, not a problem. Hey, buddy. I don't know, but I'll be up in a minute, okay? Hi. We're filming. Uh, but past that, so Hop Marcus Victorum. Um, yeah, if I don't love if I don't love the changes they make, and if I don't find myself enraptured by what they do to change it, that's okay. I, I find that I have loved so many of their games as it is, I don't need to love every single game they put out. And that brings us to River Wars Eastern Front, which I had a chance to play again. At, well, I didn't actually play this one at Gen Con. I think I found out about it at Gen Con 2022, and then very shortly after got sent a, pro a copy to go into and dive into it. And it was more River Wars, which I don't think... Uh, the, the copy I got, I enjoyed, but they didn't do enough yet to totally change up the system for me to be like, yes, I need it. It was more River Wars, which was a good thing. And But I, I, I was more intrigued by the things that were coming down the pipeline that I didn't get a chance to see in my prototype, so I'm still very much intrigued for River Wars 
Wars Eastern Front, a game that I played for four years or five years before, I guess, five years before in August 2018, I played it, and then I played it in August 2022. Is that four years later? I can't even track anymore. But anyways, uh, River Wars Eastern Front, a game that's still around and I still have hopes for. Not as the best game ever, not by a long shot, but as an accessible skirmish game that you can play, ideally, solo in a campaign now even more. And then lastly, we have Under Falling Skies. Under Falling Skies over here, continuing to play it in August of 2022. Again, I try to pit pick a mix. Sometimes I want to talk about something new. Otherwise, I want to talk and focus on the fact that I'm still playing Under Falling Skies. This is a game that I think I discovered this... I want to say right when I got, I think I discovered it in 2020. I should say I discovered it. I played in 2020. It came out around then. I want to say, I think late 2020. And so in late 2022, I'm still playing it two years later, still enjoying Under Falling Skies. It's one of those games that has held up. If you watch my content, you know that I'll be excited about a game. And then sometimes I'm still talking about that game four years later. Other times I'm talking about it for seven months before I'm like, you know what? I've seen what it has to offer and now I'm ready to let it go. And Under Falling Skies is still a game that um, I'm still excited about. Uh, I think I found Under Falling Skies around the same time that I found Super Fantasy Brawl. And Under Falling Skies is still here holding strong. And Super Fantasy Brawl has finally left my collection or will be leaving my collection depending on when you watch different videos. And that's interesting to just see the evolution over time of two games I very much fell in love with. But one I kind of slowly paced myself away from and the other... I still think this gives me one of the best dice optimization games and one of CGE's better games, although Arnak and Codenames are definitely giving it a strong run for its money. And that's what we have for our look back across five years of August. We'll be back next month with a look back across five years of September's to see what else is new, old, staying and going and all of that. In any case, and until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. Hope you enjoyed this video, and as always, I hope you have a good one.